My name is Clancy Emerson. I'm an alcoholic. Not too much applause. I've only got an hour. You can turn your tape on now, Dick. Yeah. July 21st, I was walking through the streets of Saskatoon. No, those are your notes. The, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I talk about I would like to say really seriously that the two talks we've just heard, I think, are the two best talks I've heard in this convention. I, uh, I hope the talks tomorrow morning in the Kingdom are as good as those were about Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's what we're here for. I'm uh, very glad to be here this morning. Uh, I'm glad our Southwest trustee Jan, Jan is directing the meeting. Her accent has a warm and wonderful spot in my heart. When I lived in El Paso and directed a grand opera at the university there, and shortly after that I was taken to the psychiatric ward. <laughs> and uh, someone with that same accent says, Boy, we're going to hip you. <laughs> and I I was naive enough to think that that meant some constructive growth process and <laughs> turned out to mean a lot of electric shock treatments. And they put me away in Big Spring State Mental Hospital where I spent a lot of time and, and I would like to get even with the people who put me there but when you've had a lot of shock treatments you forget who they were. You just... <laughs> the one thing I'll say about that experience though, they, they, I was not put in the nut house for drinking, I was put in there for psychiatric reasons and they had me in there as a suicide and my diagnosis was split personality, bad schizophrenia. And I've often said that I'd like to go back to El Paso sometime to the El Paso County Hospital and find that old psychiatrist who must be pretty old and feeble now, I should be able to move him around pretty good <laughs> and say, you old quack, you, know, you call me a split personality, a dual personality, you ought to use your license. God, if I could have got my personalities down to two, I'd have made it. <laughs> yeah, I, my problem has always been this committee that forms in my head at the sign of the, any frustration whatsoever. Let's get out of here. Don't think we can. Yes, I think we can. I don't know. Don't win. <laughs> I, uh, I hear people in AA today say, maybe I need group therapy. Maybe this isn't enough. Well, I've never needed group therapy. I'd just go for a ride alone in my car, you know. <laughs> uh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. But we are here this morning to discuss what I think is probably the most, in my opinion, the most important single aspect of recovery, which is the primary purpose. Many people travel around the country, and I do a little bit, and see, see the traditions under a great deal of attack all over the country, all over the world where AA is. <laughs> well, now I've lost my place and have to start over again. <laughs> my name is Clancy and was going to... But this is a serious proposition because in my opinion the language the language that we speak here is what makes Alcoholics Anonymous, that differentiates it. The, uh, we sometimes forget what a, what a fragile gift this was, as mentioned last night at the Kingdom, that there were ten calls made, the tenth call was the one that got through. And if, I've stood in the Mayflower Hotel in Akron years ago and tried to visualize what it must have been like. He wasn't just lonely and frustrated, the deal he came up to Akron on, he had just blown, he didn't have enough money to get train fare back to New York, he was wiped out. And he stood in the lobby of this Mayflower Hotel, and over there there's a door that says cocktails and little red neon sign, cheap little neon sign. And he started to walk in there, as he said later. And over here at the wall are some telephones. But he promised his friends in New York he'd go over there and make a call, so he called and got hung up on and rejected several times and treated like a piece of junk. And I'll tell you, most people like me, and I presume like many of you, would have said I did the best I could. I did the best I could. I will just have a couple drinks while I decide what to do next. And uh, it's funny, but it isn't funny. That's a fragile, thin line where we wouldn't be here at all. 
with a fragile thin line of Roland accidentally bumping into Ebby in Vermont in the only two week period that he ever was there that no well, Ebby isn't there or the fragile experience of Ebby having to testify to the Oxford movement and happening to remember that he had his old friend Bill Wilson in that city a series of fragile very fragile threads and so he finally on that tenth call or whatever it was got a hold of this somebody who's going to put him in touch with this drunken doctor who he could see the next day and here it was a Saturday afternoon and he was hot about ten bucks in his pocket desperate afraid lonely nobody cares and I'll tell you I would have I'm, I, I don't know what I'd have done but I suspect I would have run I would have run and I suspect this would have just been a fantasy in somebody's mind this meeting today or this convention or anything that deals with our recovery but somehow they got this fragile thing together and he went out and talked to this drunken doctor as we know and the man that drove the drunken doctor there was on the stage last night uh, young Bob now he's old but he was young Bob then <laughs> but uh, I've talked to him about that he, he's the only surviving member of the, that whole group that watched the meet and uh, Later when Bill moved into their house, which was kind of a lucky break for Bill, he didn't have train fare to go anywhere else. <laughs> but I said to Bob, you know, I said, that must have been, what a great moment for you, this. You were present at the beginning of one of the greatest spiritual movements of all time, certainly in the century, and you were there, it must have been exhilarating. And he said, no, no, it wasn't. He said, I thought it was kind of crappy. <laughs> He was 16 years old. He said, my dad was sober, but he was sober a lot anyway. He was a periodic. And this guy from New York was a nice guy, a little intense for my tastes. <laughs> and he said, you can never bring anybody home after school. There's always somebody on the sofa smelling like peraldehyde while they hovered over him. Or somebody crawling down the rain spout to get away from these fanatics. But of course, God moved slowly but surely to punish heresy. <laughs> Young Bob never drank. He grew up and married an alcoholic and is now an Al-Anon. <laughs> well, I suspect Bob, God overreacted. <laughs> we, uh, but I was with Bob and his charming wife last Saturday night in Wichita Falls, Texas, and we laughed about this, and it's, a, it's always a touching story to me. But what, what was the big deal? I mean, you hear about, so here's Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob stay sober a couple weeks. They sit around and discuss spiritual matters, Oxford Group spirituality matters, and pretty soon Dr. Bob is drunk again on a train, and pretty soon he's sobered up again. In fact, his sponsor bought him his last drink to steady his hand so he could do the surgery he had to do that morning. I told my sponsor about that story years later, and he, uh, he said, I don't think you're going to do any surgery, sweat it out. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> but then Dr. Bob stayed sober, and, and a lot of people think, well, I guess he stayed sober because uh, they got that Oxford Group message. Bill told Dr. Bob about the Oxford Group, and he stayed sober. But there's one thing that, if you're kind of new, you might not realize. Dr. Bob was already a spiritual leader of the Oxford Movement when he was drunk. This, he wasn't hearing anything new. He heard nothing new at all. Just that somebody else was sober. As he wrote later, and said later, what, could, what impressed him about Bill Wilson was that he, Bill Wilson, sounded as though he knew how he, Dr. Bob, felt. They had, he felt a communication for the first time someone had the feelings about drinking that he had and he was staggered by it. And they realized sitting around discussing spiritual matters didn't keep anybody sober. It hadn't kept Bill sober in New York. He'd been picking guys off bar stools, none of whom stayed sober but Bill did. And so they went up and got this Bill D in the hospital. This guy from Kentucky, lawyer from Kentucky, I heard him talk many, many years ago. And he said something to the effect of, 
Well, them two fellers came in my bed. I thought they were going to talk to me about my drink, and everybody else had. And they never talked to me about my drinking once. They talked to me about their drinking and how they felt. And I just couldn't believe it. They sounded just like me. And he says, I decided to stick with them fellers. He's been working ever since. Till he died. And on and on and on. Everybody who got the message, most of those people got drunk in those early days, like they do now. Most of the people get drunk today. Except most of them died drunk. I've heard it said that, I guess it's correct, that the those first so-called hundred, really 79, who were sober a year when the book was written, most of them died drunk. Not because AA doesn't work, but because of the nature of the illness. But the thing that makes AA work at all, it come, turns out to be, is there is something here that has never been present anywhere. The data that is available here has been available for centuries, for, you know, all sorts of places. What makes Alcoholics Anonymous different, what makes it unique and special to us today, is exactly as it was on July 10th, or June 10th, rather, 1935, when Dr. Bob came off that last trunk. And I got to remember this because this is what I've come to believe so implicitly, and I suppose, I hope you at least consider it. Alcoholics Anonymous is not the book. It's a nice book, but you can own that book. I owned it for years and never got sober. I read it. I still didn't get sober. It isn't meetings, it isn't people, it isn't love, it isn't understanding, it isn't spirituality. All of these things are adjuncts to Alcoholics Anonymous. These are great supportive aspects of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is today, as the same it was on June 10th, 1935, it is one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him reduce his feelings of difference at least enough so that he will begin to take actions he does not yet believe in. <laughs> and that really is what's lost when we attempt to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to people who are not alcoholics. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you just... But the number, to me, one of the great problems of all alcoholics, if you are like me, it's one of your great problems, and it has been all your life, a deep-seated feeling of, yes, but my case really is different. It's different in AA, and it's different out of AA, and they mean well when they're trying to help me, but they don't really understand. And that's what kills people. Monday, or, you know, I go to work in the morning, and I step over bodies dying outside my office. And you would think that I should be able to help them, but they are immersed, they are beyond help in their immersion in yes, but my case is different. And anyone who goes out to drink knows that their case is different. Chapter 3 describes people whose case is different. Because they all can prove in the last analysis, my problem really isn't alcohol. I have deep-seated feelings and emotions and I, you don't understand. I know you can help me do drinking. I was in and out of AA for years, had great people try to help me, but in my mind's eye, I was able to fend off everything, because you could always prove, yes, I am sure AA works for people whose problem is drinking, but it doesn't work for people who have deep and intense problems in addition to the drinking and what brings about the drinking. And so people like me, and I presume like many of you, live in this feeling of difference. The purpose of, the great goal of Alcoholics Anonymous, it seems to me, that the thing that must be hurdled is somehow enable the patient to begin to understand maybe I'm not as totally different as I feel. Maybe it isn't as, maybe there is someone who understands. One of the, I think one of the great things of a sponsor, if you have a sponsor you can respect, that the day comes when he says, oh yes, I, I understand and you believe he really does understand. Because all of my life I heard people say, yes, yes, I understand. And I thought, no, you don't. Not really. You think you do. You understand the story I gave you because that's what I want you to know. But nobody really understands because I don't understand. I just have these feelings. And when I drink, it alleviates them and it fills the holes that sobriety makes that make me unable to live. And this feeling of difference, I think, is the curse 
and it'll never go totally go away. If you think it's gone away, just wait till the next time you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And it'll be right there again. And we all have days where things aren't working out, and the signal comes again. Maybe you're not, maybe this isn't for you after all. <laughs> well, maybe you've just wasted 31 years on a false illusion. <laughs> but that is not, of course, the case. I think the best analogy I know about that is this one alcoholic talks to another. Why? You know, today, many treatment facilities, I guess, as Al said, they're trying to do the best they can for their patient, or they're trying to do the best, at least get some kind of a recovery ratio, so they send people to Alcoholics Anonymous. In our area, and I'm sure in your area, because I hear it all over the world, they take people who are not alcoholics at all and say, just go tell them you're an alcoholic, then they can't throw you out. Whatever your problem is, overeating, narcotics, whatever, it's just tell them you're an alcoholic. And it sounds good, they come to me and say, I'm an alcoholic, can't throw me out. But they never get it, and they live in pain, and they live in feeling different, and they exude something. You know, it's an amazing thing how that difference is. Al alluded to it this morning. But the non-alcoholic trustee last night, wonderful man, chairman of our board of trustees, just a fine man, a hard-working man. But when he said he was a non-alcoholic trustee, it's as though there was a dim somebody turned down the sound in the hall. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Nothing to do with him. And he is a wonderful man. But you could, and then he finally got done with his remarks. Excellent. Nothing, nothing you could take exception to at all. Fine remarks. Flinched a little bit when he said we. <laughs> but, uh, but, he, but he got done and he said, and now uh, I'd like to introduce Ruth B. And you could just feel the surge come back up. Because ah, there's that identity. It's an odd thing. People like us who've spent our lives fighting against the term alcoholic get to a point where the worst put down you can give to someone is to say, I don't even think she's alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a lang it's the language of one alcoholic talking to another. You know, all of the, all of the major other 12-step programs have been started by people who were in AA, who felt they, other people like them needed help. The guy that founded Gamblers Anonymous, member of AA. I knew him well. Married to a very distinguished, now at that time married to a woman who is now the longest sobriety of any woman in the world. And he founded GA. And it was just for people who needed identification. Uh, OA was founded by, within a couple blocks of the 6300 Club of Los Angeles. Uh, NA was founded by members of AA and North Hollywood Clubhouse. All of these were founded by people who realized they could not identify with drinking. In fact, I began to get my first understanding of that about, about 1960. OA didn't have many recoveries at that time. I don't think they had any by the looks of them. <laughs> I'm not judging, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, glad the, uh, I'm glad the signer didn't see that gesture. <laughs> yeah. oh, <you're> <laughs> But anyway, but they asked AA members to come over and talk at the first meetings of OA. I was over and talked to them. And you know, I was skinny then and didn't have any friends to eat. And I, was, I went over and talked to these about a couple of years sober and they had, I talked to maybe their third or fourth meeting then for several. But they're kind of plump ladies sitting around a room and uh, I talked, they asked me to talk about obsessions because they seemed to feel I was an authority on that. Not the, not the recovery from obsessions, just obsessions. And uh, 
I talked at this OA meeting and I sat down and I thought things have really helped and then they talked and I was appalled I never heard of anything like that I mean this woman said and then I I ate this whole chicken and I, I ate a cake and, and I thought to myself you sick puke yeah. 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 and some woman some woman said I ate till I couldn't eat anymore. I went and put my finger on my throat and made room for more food. And I thought, boy, you ought to be in a nut house, you know. <laughs> I can understand doing that drinking, but eating? <laughs> yeah. oh. Why don't you just eat like a man? And I also talked at early GA meetings. No guy, every come over to GA meetings, and I, I was appalled listening to their discussion. You know, and then I, I got back in my feet, and I, I went to Gardena, and I started playing low ball again. <laughs> and it all went. And I thought, Geez, you know, guy like you shouldn't even gamble. <laughs> no. But I'm going to tell you something. I was there talking about obsessions to people that I intellectually understood their problem. But I could have sat till next Christmas and I would never have identified with the nature of their relief. Because it doesn't do that to me. That's why we have alcoholic to alcoholic. I've talked to narcotics, early meetings of Narcotics Anonymous. I've talked to the 1970s, the beginning of CA, Cocaine Anonymous. And it, it's the same thing. I understand them, and I, I want good for them, but I also know I don't identify with them. Because the same way that I expect non-alcoholics to write, don't you understand why I'm doing this? They don't understand. Because there's that old thing we've said before. The difference between non-alcoholics and me has a number of things, but it boils down to one thing. When they drink alcohol, it goes and they say, no more for me, I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> and when I drink alcohol, it doesn't go, it goes. All the discussion in the world and intellectual knowledge will never change that. That is why you cannot have mixed meetings. That's why really Alcoholics Anonymous meetings require, in my opinion only, alcoholics to talk at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. I don't want to hear a doctor, I don't want to hear a clergyman, I mean I love them. I don't want to hear an Al Anon, I don't want to hear an Alateen, I want to hear an alcoholic talking to alcoholics, explaining what to do about it. Because that is our primary purpose, to carry the message to the people who still suffer. You know it's an interesting thing, if you ever read that old thing in the, that first version of Big Book, I know some of you have seen that. I think the 12th step, if I recall, it's the way Bill originally wrote it, because he was a great, you know, he wanted to help all mankind, and 12th step, having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to other people, he said, to, I guess to the world. And somebody, when they talked it over, and Dr. Bob and the people around at that time, they changed that to uh, alcoholics. Somehow they had intuitive feeling. In the 1940s, before the traditions, or the late middle 1940s, before there were any traditions, someone sent a article about the Washingtonians to Bill Wilson. He had never heard of it apparently. And he read about a movement in 1840 that had worked successfully with alcoholics unlike anything in the world's history. And they had come to grow and they, similar in many ways to AA, people went to each other's groups and talked to each other's towns. They assumed there were maybe a 100,000 sober alcoholics by 1845, 
much faster rate of recovery than AA ever had, and they got immersed in other things, politics, temperance, anti-slavery stuff, and helping people with other problems. And by 1848, to all intents and purposes, the group had been expired. There were few people left. But uh, why was that? Abraham Lincoln addressed the Washingtonians in 1846 about slavery movement. And that's really was the germ of the 12 traditions. He began writing the 12 traditions after he, and he, much of the experience the Washingtonians had became part of our traditions because he had seen it in AA, I guess he hadn't quite crystallized it, about getting involved in other matters, about doing other things, about being, being caught up in less, you know, one of the things that killed the Washingtonians is because they vied for who would get the most publicity for the speakers and so on. And they, that's one of the reasons we got our anonymity as a spiritual concept. We wouldn't vie for that sort of thing. And certainly was the great one, one of the great ones is our primary purpose is to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to alcoholics who still suffer, drunk or sober, I suppose. It doesn't mean necessarily drunken alcoholics. It means those of us who are suffering, and each of us suffer from time to time and need the same message we already know. But it's the language of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is the primary purpose of why we are here and why we do these things. We say, what have we come to learn about sobriety? I'm going to tell you something. I have not heard anything new that I can think of in an AA meeting in a quarter of a century. I really haven't. I haven't heard anything new. If I'm there to hear new facts every time and new information, I'm out of luck. What I'm here is to hear the language of the heart, as they described it in the International Convention a few times back. The language of one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to remind me I'm not so different, that I'm not as big as I think I am, that my problems are not so gross, and to center me back into a feeling of, yes, I am who I am and it's all right to be me. Now, in order to bring this about, we must have Alcoholics Anonymous, I suppose, as Alice said and Jana said, and I'm sure we, most of us believe. I'm sure anyone who would go to a meeting like this is a right-wing fascist pig anyway. <laughs> we're not, we're not uh, converting anybody. They're all at the real meetings. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, I don't know why I said that. Take that off the tape, Nick. <laughs> the only advantage of sponsoring the taper here is that you can edit your remarks later. <laughs> uh, but that's what we do here. We gather together, share our experience, strength, and hope. And, and the primary purpose is, is, as it always was, to help us reduce our feelings of difference. And we will never completely reduce them, and they'll always be there, and we will always face conflicts in our lives that'll bring them back to varying degrees. But there's something to do about it. And that's why it is terribly, terribly dangerous, in my opinion, to have people who do not carry this message as much as we love them or need them. I sit in meetings sometimes, places now, and I hear I get up and talk about narcotics for 55 minutes, and he talks about the steps, he talks about purity, but I really haven't identified with him anything. I've identified with some of the things he does, but I think about the newcomer. The newcomer does not identify with that. I would identify with that. What finally enabled me to identify with it is that a man finally convinced me that he knew how I felt, and on that basis I began to take actions I would never have taken for anybody else. And I know the language is, comes this way. Don't, this is the applause signal, you dummy. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. God damn it. <laughs> I'll tell you a good example. Why, I have three daughters at this convention. They're in this hall tonight. One got her first birthday about three weeks ago. One got her first birthday about a week ago. One's having her first birthday in a couple days. Now, no, no, don't. They have done nothing worthy of your applause. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is, I've sponsored a lot of people over the years. Maybe they haven't turned out well, but... <laughs> I've sponsored them, and I travel around a lot, and I know a lot about AA, and I'm a repository of great wisdom, I think. And I, uh, 
I know nuances of the psyche that would stagger Dr. Jung. <laughs> and I talked to my three daughters, and I say, boy, are they lucky they got a father who knows AA in and out. And I say, now here's what you do in this situation. And they say, we don't want to hear it, Dad. Because <laughs> I'm not an AA to them, I'm their dad. And nobody listens to dads. I don't think that's right, Dad. I'm going to call my sponsor. She's got three years. <laughs> my oldest daughter and I are sharing a room at this convention. She's an attorney in the, or a DA or something in Albuquerque. Now, this morning, you know, I'm getting up and I'm feeling good and positive. I'm saying to her, now here's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll get a hold of the other kids and we'll go over and have a... And I, she demurred, and I pointed out a little more strongly. She said, well, you certainly know how to ruin a morning, don't you? <laughs> and I tried to explain to her, I am not just your father, I'm Clancy I from up in the sky. <laughs> but it's a perfect example. My intellectual knowledge doesn't help. She has to identify with a sponsor who has saved her bacon. And all of those girls do, and that's exactly the way it should be. That's why fathers can never help children, and children can never help parents, because there's all sorts of emotions involved. It boils down to something else. And that also, of course, is the same reason why in our traditions it specifically states that we have special groups in the international lawyers in AA, the international doctors in AA, air, airline birds of a feather, they all have meetings here, uh, actors, so on. And it's not like that should really be a great thing because they can get together with peers and they can really do it. But every one of those organizations say, we only are going to help you identify. You've got to get into Alcoholics Anonymous. You've got to get beyond this. Do you know why that is? Because if they stay there, they will reinforce their feelings of being different. It's different to be a pilot. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that as an attack, but that's what they say within their own organization. The successful members say that. Uh, Dr. Hal M., who's a guru in the Washington area, he forces them out of there quickly and gets them out. And that's why we, gotta, we must take the actions that help us reduce the feelings of being different, and we must get the information from people who we believe understand how we feel. It's not an attack on anybody. But that's why they formed other organizations so that they can, so they can identify and take actions they would not ordinarily take based on intellectual understanding or appreciation. The uh, the bottom line, the bottom line for each and every one here, that we have to remember when we get out of here, when we have to when we go forth into the back into the world tomorrow afternoon, we're not going out there to be the harbingers of saving the world. Sometimes people say, in a few years, AA will take over the world. Everybody will live by these principles. You can't even get a guy dying from alcoholism to live by these principles. <laughs> yeah. We better not worry about whether the city council in Chicago is going to do it. We better see if I can do it. But we're not, we can be do better, we can live more comfortably, we can live with more understanding, we can live with more appreciation, we can try to assume that uh, the prayers are better to be under, or to understand than to be understood and to love and be loved and so on. But the primary purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion, as I said before and I'm going to say it as I close early, I might point out. <laughs> <laughs> she has her finger over the red button, I, I ignite in four minutes. The primary purpose for me to go forth is the same as it was when Bill Wilson sat and talked to Dr. Bob coming off a drunk in Akron, Ohio, and they went to do Bill D and on and on up until the time your sponsor talked to you and you talked to a newcomer. And it's this. My primary purpose is not to be wonderful, loving, spiritual, kind. My primary purpose is to be part of the chain of one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him reduce his feelings of difference at least enough so that he will begin to take actions 
that will help him stay alive for the rest of his life. I am most pleased to be part of that chain. I'm pleased you're part of that chain. I'm pleased to be part of this international convention. First convention I went to, the speaker I heard was Bill Wilson and Ebby. And that turned me around and today I feel the same feeling. I feel love and enthusiasm and